All right, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, it's super quiet. It's not usually this, <laughs> this quiet. Okay, so we're going to start off with a, a new uh, topic today, uh, so computer vision. And this is going to be the, the last uh, major kind of module for the course, uh, vision combined with, uh, with machine learning. Uh, so this is motivation uh, from the last module that we were discussing, localization, mapping, state estimation. Uh, we discussed these kind of pretty abstractly. So we had an abstract sensor model, some probability distribution on sensor measurement ZT, uh, given the, the state of the, the robot XC. Uh, and we discussed some concrete instantiations of these sensor models. So we spent a little bit of time, for example, talking about uh, laser rangefinders or rangefinders in general. Uh, in the next few lectures, we're going to focus on one particular sensor modality, which is particularly powerful, uh, which, is, which is vision. Uh, and so just to give you a, a sense for why vision is this powerful and, and what kinds of things one can do uh, with vision, uh, I'll give you a, a few different example applications. Uh, so here's one, this is drone racing. This is not autonomous, uh, but like human uh, drone racing. But uh, I guess what's impressive about this is that this is purely vision-based, right? So this is a FPV, first-person view, uh, goggles uh, that these competitors are, are wearing. Uh, and the only uh, thing that they're relying on to, to navigate uh, through these obstacle courses is vision. Uh, they, of course, don't have a, uh, like direct access to an IMU or anything, so it's purely uh, vision-based uh, navigation. Uh, here's the autonomous version. Uh, this is relatively recent, I think uh, maybe from the, the last uh, year or so. Uh, from a group at the University of uh, Zurich, led by Davide Scaramucci. So this is drone racing out outdoors. Uh, this is still human piloted. This first clip. And this is the autonomous version. We demonstrate it in many environments like forests, disaster zones, and buildings. High speed navigation in these environments is challenging for existing algorithms. Our drone can fly at speeds up to 40 kilometers per hour. The key idea to achieve such agility is to directly map noisy sensory observations to collision free trajectories. So yeah, it's not quite uh, human level yet, I think, but, uh, but still like, pretty impressive. Like 40 uh, kilometers per hour is, uh, is really fast, especially through these cluttered uh, kinds of uh, environments. Uh, and this is, again, vision-based. Uh, there are other sensors as well, uh, like uh, the standard sensors that a drone has, uh, but the primary sensing modality for sensing obstacles in the environment here is uh, vision. Uh, and of course, it's not just drones that, that use vision. Uh, autonomous vehicles uh, use vision quite a bit. Uh, Tesla, in, in particular, is like really committed to this uh, vision of only vision, uh, like doing uh, navigation uh, purely based on vision, not using LiDAR or anything like that. And I guess part of the argument is humans can do it, like humans rely uh, only on vision to, to drive, uh, and so that's kind of an existence proof. In principle, uh, we should be able to get uh, autonomous uh, navigation purely based on vision as well, uh, not using other sensors like LiDAR, at least that, that's kind of what, what they're uh, trying to do. Um, uh, and from vision, you can extract lots of information. So this is one of the, the reasons vision is, is particularly powerful. Uh, one particularly important piece of information has to do with geometry, uh, so depth estimation. So using vision to figure out where uh, obstacles uh, in the environment are, and in particular, uh, distances to, to different points uh, in the, uh, the image. Uh, this is one example. Uh, of doing depth estimation uh, in a uh, kind of vehicle uh, setup. So there's a car driving around, there's a camera on the car, uh, and they're estimating uh, depth uh, to every pixel. Uh, so the color here uh, corresponds to the, the, the estimated depth uh, for, uh, for the different pixels. Uh, here's another example. So this is uh, tracking objects with a, a drone. Uh, this is actually from the, the same group 
uh, that I showed the video from before. Uh, here they're using a camera to track uh, a target on the ground, which you'll see in just a second. So there's a ground robot, like a wheeled robot that's moving along with an X uh, drawn on it. Uh, the drone is tracking that uh, uh, like marker and then uh, using that tracking to, to land on the drone. I think it gets faster uh, somewhere, somewhere at the end. Okay. Uh, another key kind of uh, piece of information that one can extract from vision, uh, and this is from videos, uh, has to do with uh, velocities or optical flow. Uh, we're actually going to spend a, a bunch of time uh, in the next lecture uh, talking exclusively about optical flow, but just to give you a sense, uh, what's going on here is this is a video taken from the perspective of a car that's moving around, uh, and the arrows correspond to uh, uh, like estimated uh, motion uh, in the image. So basically, each if the arrow is like pointing this way, it seems like uh, objects uh, in that portion of the image are moving uh, in, in that direction. Uh, and the, the magnitude of the, the vector uh, corresponds to the, the magnitude of the estimated uh, velocity. Um, and this is what you, drones use for doing uh, velocity estimation. Um, so I guess you might have noticed uh, that the Crazy Fly drones and other drones as well have a downward facing camera. Uh, so we've mentioned this a couple of times before, uh, and I'll, yeah, we'll talk more about it uh, in the next lecture. Uh, but this is kind of what it looks like. So you have a, a camera that's facing downwards uh, that can see uh, the ground moving. Uh, and based on the apparent motion of the ground, uh, the drone can figure out its own uh, velocity. Uh, you need to also know the height uh, that the, the drone is at to get the, the magnitude uh, kind of correct. Uh, but if you have a, a height sensor, you can combine the information that you're getting from your downward facing camera uh, to actually estimate the, the velocity of the drone, and then you can integra integrate that to, to get uh, position as well. Uh, here's another important uh, kind of information that you can extract from vision. So it's not just uh, geometric information like, uh, like depth or, or velocities, uh, but you can also get uh, semantic information. Uh, so for instance, uh, doing object detection and segmentation uh, so here again, there's a, a video of, uh, of uh, like different scenes, uh, and each pixel uh, has an associated uh, label. Uh, so uh, there's like a road, uh, sidewalk, car, building, and so on. Uh, and so basically, uh, like the, the images are getting automatically uh, labeled. Like each pixel in the image is getting automatically labeled uh, with some semantic uh, category uh, that, that's kind of being estimated from the, uh, the video. Uh, activity recognition, uh, that's, that's another uh, kind of interesting application. Uh, so what's, yeah, what's going on in the, the video? Uh, this is not a, a state-of-the-art model. I think this is from a, a few years ago. But yeah, I guess it has 95% confidence uh, that, uh, that someone in the, in the video is, uh, is playing the, the piano. There's some random stuff, uh, uh, other like labels as well, but some low probability. Um, another uh, kind of important application, especially like these days, is, is uh, uh, captioning images, so automatic uh, image captioning. Uh, so if I give you these images, uh, can you figure out, like automatically write some uh, label, uh, some caption for the, the image? Uh, and yeah, it's kind of relatively uh, good. So the, the first uh, image, a man in, in black shirt is playing the guitar. That's a pretty accurate caption of what's going on in the first image. Uh, construction worker in orange safety vest is working on road. Uh, that's also uh, a pretty good uh, caption, and it's like kind of surprisingly uh, detailed, right? Like it's getting the color, construction worker, safety vest, and, and so on. Um, the third one is not quite as accurate. Uh, so two young girls are, are playing with the Lego toy. Uh, yeah, it's probably not two young girls. I think it's like a, a young girl and, and her uh, and someone like older, maybe an adult. Uh, but it's still like reasonably uh, good. Uh, and these things are getting like better and better. Uh, as we, uh, yeah, uh, progress. Question? Um, yes, and how much of these semantics, like these more recent uh, models, take semantics into account? Or are they more just like, oh, here's, here's the status set? Yeah. Like videos and like models, you pick and choose which numbers are the best. Yeah, yeah, so definitely the, the latter. Uh, so the semantic information is being automatically learned. Uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll say a bit more about that in, in uh, later lectures. But yeah, it's very much here's a gigantic data set, uh, basically the entire like internet, all the images on the internet, uh, with associated captions. 
uh, and learn how to take a new image and, and uh, uh, come up with an associated uh, caption. Uh, there's, I guess, more uh, kind of nefarious uh, applications as well that, that people have been uh, talking quite a bit about. Let me just play a few seconds of this. That's thanks to spread of deep fakes. Deep fakes are videos that have been altered using machine learning a form of artificial intelligence to show someone saying or doing something that they did not, in fact, do or say. The results can be great fun. Take, for example, these hilarious clips of Nicolas Cage starring in movies that he's never in. But deep fakes can also be a tool for harassment and a way to spread political misinformation. To learn more about the deep fakes. Uh, yeah, I won't, I won't play the, uh, the interview. I guess if you're interested, I, I put the. Uh, um, URL to the, the video if you want to uh, take a look. Uh, but okay, so I guess these are many different uh, applications all involving vision uh, somehow or the other. Uh, if you abstract away the kind of details, uh, one way to think about uh, problems in computer vision is uh, coming up with some kind of mapping, some function uh, from either an image, like a single image, or a sequence of images, like a, a video, uh, to some label, right? So. Uh, image uh, or object uh, recognition, so given an image, uh, figure out what's uh, in the image. So is, is there a cat in the image, is there a dog in the image? Uh, that's one example of this where you go from image to uh, a category of, of object. Uh, activity recognition, you go from some sequence of images uh, in a video uh, to some uh, kind of estimated uh, activity. Uh, optical flow, you go from a sequence of images to this optical flow estimate. Uh, and I guess if you abstract things away like enough, maybe this is not a particularly useful abstraction, but you can think of robotics as uh, some mapping from pixels to, to torques, like some sequence of images uh, to uh, control uh, actions for your uh, robot. Uh, and nowadays, there's, there's a, a kind of been a massive amount of progress uh, on the inverse problem. So not going from image to label, uh, but rather going from label to image. Uh, so as an instance, uh, you could uh, give as input uh, some uh, like piece of text, like a, a sentence as, as input, uh, and the desired output is an image that's automatically generated uh, corresponding to that text. Um, so yeah, there, there's like many different uh, machine learning uh, models that have come out over, over the last uh, two years. Uh, one of the most recent ones is called uh, Stable Diffusion. This is uh, open source. You can actually, I put the link uh, so you can go and uh, play with uh, uh, with this model. Uh, don't do it now because it's like super distracting, but. <laughs> Maybe after the, the lecture, uh, uh, try out some of these. I, I was trying out uh, a couple of these uh, last night. So uh, basically, the way it works is you type in some sentence in, in English. Uh, so that's the, the sentence uh, at, the, at the top. Uh, and it generates a bunch of images uh, corresponding. Uh, so automatically generates a, a bunch of images uh, corresponding to whatever you typed in. So I typed in a robot uh, contemplating the, the meaning of life. Uh, and these are actually surprisingly good, right? Like this, yeah, it's like you really uh, get the sense, especially from the, maybe the, yeah, the first three, uh, that these robots are really contemplating <laughs> the, the meaning of life. And, and they're also like pretty kind of photorealistic or, or like realistic uh, looking uh, images. Uh, here's another one. This is uh, a bit more like wacky, I guess, just to make the point that these are not images that exist on the internet, right? Like these are just uh, automatically being generated on the fly. Uh, so a quadrotor that looks like a parrot. Um, so I think maybe three of them are, are pretty reasonable. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on in the, the top right. That basically just looks like a, a parrot. <laughs> it's a, a quadrotor. But uh, but yeah, the other, the other ones, especially the bottom left one, I think is uh, is, is like pretty pretty good. Uh, but yeah, you can type in all sorts of like random things, and it'll uh, do its best to, to come up with images that match those. Uh, description and you can even specify styles. So you can say a quarter order that looks like a parrot in the style of uh, like Picasso or something, and we'll come up with uh, with images uh, in that style. Okay, all right. So again, just abstracting things away, uh, you can think of computer vision as, as mapping from uh, images to labels or, or labels to, to images. Uh, and computer vision is, is all about coming up with these functions, like these mappings, uh, somehow. Uh, either kind of manually specifying uh, these functions, uh, which is kind of the, the old school way of doing uh, computer vision, which we spend just a little bit of time on uh, in one lecture, uh, or learning these functions from uh, gigantic uh, data sets, which we'll also spend uh, a few lectures on. All right, so I guess why is vision powerful? Uh, it seems like more powerful than other sensing modalities like, uh, like LiDAR, uh, for instance. 
Um, and I think the, the main reason is that vision provides an extremely rich source of information. So it's not purely geometric information that you're getting from vision, uh, but you get something about uh, like semantics, right? Something about like meaning uh, from, from vision. Uh, that is kind of hard to, to get uh, purely from a, a range sensor like, like LiDAR. Uh, another important kind of practical factor is that uh, cameras are usually passive. Uh, not all cameras, but I guess many cameras are, are usually passive. Um, so they don't rely on having to emit signals of their own. Uh, so with LiDAR, uh, there's like a LiDAR laser like beam that's going from the, the LiDAR like to the environment and then being reflected back. Uh, that's not necessarily the case with uh, just a standard kind of regular like, camera. Um, so this makes vision uh, pretty energy efficient as compared to LiDAR uh, and uh, can make the cameras like much lighter as well than, uh, than something like LiDAR. Um, so this is important for robotics applications in particular where uh, like the payload of your robot might be pretty constrained, the payload of a, a drone or even an autonomous car, I guess if you have enough autonomous cars that are using uh, more kind of uh, heavy duty sensors that can uh, like add up to a larger uh, energy uh, expense. Uh, so that, that's another kind of practical reason for, uh, for just yeah, using like pure uh, vision. Um, okay, so I guess is vision hard? Uh, so I think we know the answer now uh, is like vision is, is super hard. Uh, but back in the, the 1960s, when people first started thinking about uh, automated uh, kind of computer vision, uh, it wasn't obvious at all uh, that vision was, was going to be hard. Uh, in fact, the, the expectation was that vision was going to be super easy. Uh, and in fact, it was going to be so easy that you could solve it in a summer. Uh, so this is uh, the summer vision uh, project at, at MIT, uh, led by uh, Seymour Papert, who was a researcher at MIT. Uh, and the description for the project is that the summer vision project is an attempt to use our summer workers effectively in the construction of a significant part of a visual system. Uh, so the particular task, so they're thinking of all of vision as a task, <laughs> was chosen partly because it can be segmented into sub-problems which will allow individuals to work independently and yet participate in their construction of a system, uh, complex enough to be a real landmark in the development of uh, pattern uh, recognition. So yeah, I guess needless to say, there was no real landmark, uh, like in the development of pattern recognition back in, in, uh, in 1966, just based on a, a summer's uh, worth of work. Uh, and I think the, like our intuition, right, is, is like completely off. So uh, vision seems easy uh, because it's so easy for us as, as humans. So we go about uh, like solving all sorts of really hard vision problems. Uh, in a seemingly uh, kind of effortless uh, manner. Uh, and I think just to, to get some intuition, if you haven't thought about this kind of thing before, or, or even if you have, uh, I think it's useful to, uh, to just like sit down and, and like think about how you would do something like object recognition. Uh, so given an image, just decide whether or not there's a, a cat in the image. Uh, so yeah, think about like what makes a cat a cat, right? And how would you describe that uh, as some kind of mathematical uh, function? Uh, so yeah, you could you could have uh, like ears uh, or whiskers, uh, but like describing those things uh, geometrically is, is actually uh, geometrically and, and kind of mathematically precisely um, to cover uh, the space of all cats uh, is is like a really challenging problem. All right, I guess any questions so far? Pause for a second. Okay, so to get some more intuition for for why vision is hard, so let's just start with. Uh, the real kind of uh, basics of, of vision. So what is an image? So we said vision is about going from images to, to labels or, or labels to images. Uh, so what exactly is an image? Um, so roughly an image is just some digital uh, representation uh, of visual information that you get from a, a camera. Uh, so you can think of it as an array of pixels. Uh, and there are different kinds of images uh, kind of based on the, the application that you're looking at. So the simplest kind uh, is what's known as a binary image. So each pixel, each location in the image uh, is just a zero or one. Uh, and basically what this corresponds to is whether the intensity of light uh, that's being measured at that pixel is above or below some threshold. So if it's above some threshold, uh, that's a one. If it's below some threshold, uh, that's a, a zero. Uh, slightly more uh, uh, of a, a rich uh, representation is a grayscale image. Uh, so this uh, pixel value or pixel value for a grayscale image represents the uh, level of intensity of light uh, that's being measured um, at, that, at that pixel. 
uh, and color images. Um, so that's a, a, a where a pixel value is a three by one vector uh, representing like the intensity of specific colors. Uh, so RGB, that's maybe the, the most common representation. So the intensity of green, red, the intensity of green, uh, and the, the intensity of, uh, of blue. Um, and yeah, I guess this is uh, an example of a, a grayscale uh, image, uh, heavily pixelated, just so you can, you can see uh, kind of what it looks like. Uh, so the image, the grayscale image is on the, the left, uh, and on the, the right is what the, the computer is getting, right? So somehow from this array of numbers uh, corresponding to different light intensities, uh, you have to decide whether or not there's a, a face uh, in the image. Uh, and so yeah, maybe this gives you a, a sense for, for why it's super complicated. There's a massive amount of information that's embedded uh, in that uh, array of, uh, of pixels. Uh, and somehow from that uh, gigantic amount of information, that high dimensional vector, uh, you need to make some decision about whether or not there's a, a face in the image, for instance. Okay, so I guess how are images formed? Uh, so the simplest model uh, of image formation is a pinhole uh, camera. Uh, this is actually like a surprisingly useful abstraction. There's a lot more going on, which I'll mention in a bit, but yeah, this is a reasonable place to, uh, to start thinking about the, the geometry of image formation. Uh, so the setup here is you have a, a camera that just has a, a small hole, a pinhole, uh, that light can pass through. So light uh, reflected from some objects uh, in the environment uh, pass through the, the pinhole uh, and basically hit the, uh, the screen uh, at the, the back of the, the box, at the back of the, the camera, uh, and you measure the intensity of light uh, at every location at the, uh, the screen at the back of the camera. Um, so here's a, a two-dimensional uh, kind of model of the, the pinhole camera. Um, so here the, the light is coming from the right, uh, the screen uh, is, at the, uh, uh, is on, on the left, uh, and you have some point uh, that's at some distance z away from uh, the kind of front uh, plane of the camera uh, and at some like height y away from the, the line uh, that's at the, the middle of the, the camera. Uh, the camera has some focal length, so that's the, the distance between the plane that contains the, the pinhole uh, and the plane that contains the, the screen, uh, so the, the image plane. Uh, so if you denote the, the world coordinates, like the coordinates of uh, some point in, in the, uh, other in the world is y and z, uh, then the image coordinate is just one coordinate because we're looking at uh, 2D image formation uh, is given by y prime. Uh, and just using some, some basic uh, trigonometry, you can see that y over z, that's the, the tangent of the, the angle, uh, equals y prime over f. f is a parameter of the camera, that's something you can measure. Uh, and so you get that y prime equals uh, fy over z. Uh, and I guess one thing to note here is that the image is flipped, right? So positive y uh, corresponds to, uh, to the up direction in the world. Uh, positive y prime uh, corresponds to the, the down uh, direction in the image plane. Uh, you can also generalize this to, to 3D. Um, so now you have uh, x, y, z. Those are your uh, coordinates of some point uh, in, in the world. Uh, again, you have some uh, distance, f, that's your focal length, from the, the plane uh, that contains the, the pinhole to the, the image plane. Uh, and now you have two uh, image uh, coordinates, x prime and y prime. Uh, and again, just using some basic trigonometry, you can derive how some point that's located uh, at, at x, y, z uh, gets mapped to an image coordinate, uh, so x prime and, and uh, y prime. Uh, and this depends on the parameter uh, of your camera, which is the, the focal uh, length. Question? Um, so just like intuitively, for example, yeah. if z is larger, which is the farther away, x prime y prime is going to be smaller, so the object is going to look smaller. Yes, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, if the focal length is larger, so if your camera is extremely large, uh, then the object will look uh, larger as well. Yeah. Good, other questions? Okay, so I think, yeah, like I said, the, the pinhole camera is a, is a useful start to, to, uh, to understand how images are formed. Uh, but real image formation is, is much, much, much more uh, complicated. Uh, and you need to take into account uh, a whole bunch of different factors, uh, including the specific lens that your camera has, uh, distortions that, that come from the lens, uh, pixel discretization, like the fact that uh, you have a, a finite number of pixels on your, on your camera. Um, uh, like a 10 megapixel camera or, or higher, uh, reflections uh, as well, and, and many other factors. 
Uh, so there's a whole, I guess, field of, uh, of computer graphics that looks at uh, how to uh, like do realistic uh, image generation. Uh, and some of this is, is being automated, uh, like I showed with, uh, with these uh, machine learning models, like stable uh, diffusion. OK, so that's one part, I think, of what makes uh, vision hard. So just the image uh, formation process itself is a, is a complicated thing. Um, I think the, the main reason, or what, I guess the other big reason that, that vision is hard in, in robotics in particular, uh, is that the world itself is, is pretty uh, complicated. Uh, and there are a number of, uh, maybe even like counterintuitive uh, factors that you need to uh, take into account uh, when you're thinking about uh, vision. Uh, so I'll go through just some of uh, what these challenges are. Uh, one challenge has to do with uh, projections. Um, so this is a, actually let me play the, the video. Yeah, it's an image that's painted on the, the ground. Uh, and yeah, I guess it looks like a, a little girl uh, picking up a, a ball or, or a balloon or something like that. And if you look at it from the, the right uh, distance, uh, like something like this, it actually looks uh, like, like it's uh, 3D, right? Uh, so some 2D uh, painting on the, the ground is being projected uh, onto your like, retina, uh, and your mind is perceiving this as, uh, as being uh, 3D. Uh, and I think this, the purpose of this was to, to make people slow down. Uh, this was in some uh, school area, I think, uh, and people were running fast, so they, uh, yeah, I guess this is uh, kind of... I don't know if it's like safe or, or not. Maybe it's, maybe it's not that safe, but <laughs> but at least it gets people to uh, to slow down. Um, another important challenge uh, which you'll encounter, uh, I think, when when you uh, when we do the, the final project and, and other like vision uh, assignments, uh, you'll get. I think you'll get a real appreciate, appreciation for some of these challenges uh, when we uh, like do the assignments and the and the project. Uh, but a, yeah, a really important one has to do with uh, illumination or, or lighting. Uh, so these are uh, three images corresponding to the same underlying scene. So the objects in the world are, are identical, um, but the only thing that's changing is the, the lighting. So the first one, there's some light source uh, right in the, the middle of this ring of uh, penguins or, or whatever they are. Um, yeah, the, the second and third have uh, lighting uh, at, at a different uh, location. Uh, and the resulting images look very, very different, right? Uh, so they don't, uh, like if you just focus in on any particular pixel um, and compare the intensity of light at that pixel across the three different images, uh, they look very different. Uh, and that poses a, a pretty major challenge. So if you want to do something like uh, object recognition, uh, you need to somehow discount uh, the effect that changing lighting conditions have. So you want to be able to say that this is a, a cat or a dog, uh, no matter what the, the image uh, looks like um, uh, because of, uh, of the fact that uh, the image was taken under some uh, other like lighting or different uh, lighting condition. Uh, here's a, a really interesting one, uh, shadows. Uh, so this is an optical uh, illusion uh, that goes back to Ted Edelson. Um, I guess I've, how many people have seen this illusion before? Okay, uh, some of you. Uh, all right, so, so yeah, what's going on here is that uh, the cell A uh, and the cell B uh, actually have the same uh, intensity uh, from the point of view of the image, um, which is not, yeah, it's not what your mind is perceiving, right? So your mind is perceiving uh, A to be darker uh, than B. Uh, well, I guess, yeah, probably for, for most of you, uh, your, your mind's perceiving uh, that A is darker than B. Uh, but if you look at the actual image, uh, so here's a helpful uh, way to, to look at it. Um, it's the exact same image. The only thing that's been added here is a little like gray strip uh, connecting uh, A and B. Uh, now you see that A and B, uh, like in the image, have the exact same uh, pixel like intensity, the same like grayscale uh, value. Uh, but yeah, again, somehow your your mind is uh, changing that. Uh, and, and perceiving A to be uh, darker than B uh, because uh, like it, it has some like prior knowledge about uh, shadow uh, formation. Uh, question? Um, if we were to like, run a model on this, yeah. would we want the model to also have the same kind of like to behave the same as our mind? Or yeah. To acknowledge that this is yeah, that's a good question. So 
It depends on what exactly, uh, I guess, we're trying to, to do. Uh, I think if we're trying to um, understand the 3D scene uh, somehow, like maybe it makes sense to, uh, to have the same uh, like kind of biases that, that humans have. Uh, but yeah, if you're like simply querying, like is the pixel value at A the same as the pixel value at B, that's something that, that's kind of an objective thing. Uh, and you'd want like any uh, like algorithm to, to say that those are, are equal. Uh, I guess, did you have specific applications in, in mind? Or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, like I said, it depends on the, the specific uh, application. Uh, yeah, for some applications, it, it makes sense to, to have like bake in some of the, the prior knowledge that uh, that humans have, like about like three D uh, kind of like shadow formation in this case. And for other applications, it, it may not uh, may not make sense. Um, uh, yeah, I guess another important challenge has to do with scale. So this is particularly important when you have a single camera, so a monocular camera uh, that's looking out there in the world. Uh, this is going to be a challenge when we do the, the final project because our drone has a, uh, a monocular camera, not a, a stereo uh, camera. Uh, and so it's uh, fundamentally impossible uh, without further assumptions to resolve scale, right? So you don't know, like just looking at the, the size of some object in the image, uh, like doesn't tell you the, the size of the object like out there in the 3D world, uh, unless you make some, uh, some assumptions uh, about like maybe the, the size of, uh, of like known objects in the, in the scene. Uh, viewpoint is, is another uh, like variation, uh, usually a, a kind of nuisance that you want to uh, get rid of. Uh, and it's the same kind of thing with, with lighting. Uh, so these are uh, images of the same object that are just taken from different viewpoints. Uh, and the, uh, the images look drastically different. Uh, but if you want to do something like mug detection, uh, then yeah, you want to uh, like discount the uh, the changes uh, that are appearing because of this uh, change in the in the viewpoint. Uh, occlusions. Uh, this is a, a super important one in, in robotics. Uh, so often things are are kind of uh, are occluded. So here uh, there are two humans uh, whose kind of lower like bodies are occluded by by these guards. Uh, but if you want to do pedestrian detection um, in, with an autonomous vehicle. Uh, you need to, uh, I guess, somehow be robust to, to these kinds of uh, occlusions. Uh, in this case, I guess the, the humans are, are moving to the, the left, uh, or they're, they're facing the left and probably going to move to the left, but uh, it could be that uh, like the humans might start moving to the right. And so if, if the uh, image here was taken from the perspective of an uh, autonomous vehicle, uh, you want to first detect that there are humans uh, behind the car, so you want to detect their pose, like which way they're facing, and then use that potentially to make a prediction about where they're going to go. So they're going to go uh, to the, the right uh, from this perspective. Uh, then uh, the autonomous vehicle might want to just like stop and, and not move. Um, uh, and yeah, background as well. Uh, so depending on uh, what it is that you're trying to, uh, to see in the image uh, and what the, the background looks like, uh, that can be another factor that you want to discount, right? So you want to uh, do object detection uh, with, uh, with different backgrounds, like no matter what the, uh, the background is. Uh, here's another interesting one, uh, deformations. Um, so often, I guess we assume that things are, are rigid, like especially in robotics, uh, there's a, uh, a kind of a common assumption that objects in the world are rigid, uh, which of course they're, they're not. Uh, so you can have articulated objects or, or deformable uh, objects. Um, and that's another kind of nuisance factor, right? Like you want to be able to detect that this is a person, uh, even though like the exact like geometry of the person is like changing uh, or uh, deforming, um, as as uh, yeah as is the case over here. Uh, here they're doing like three D uh, reconstruction, so they're taking uh, this video. Uh, and, and basically coming up with a, a model uh, that's, uh, that's deforming, that captures the, the 3D uh, uh, kind of uh, like space that the, the person is, uh, is occupying. 
Okay, questions on, on any of these uh, factors? All right, so let's, I guess, uh, look at a, a kind of concrete vision problem to, to build a bit more uh, intuition and, and to build some of the, the basic uh, techniques that we're going to describe in more uh, detail uh, in later lectures. Uh, we're going to think about this problem of uh, lane detection as a kind of toy uh, vision problem. This is a, a running uh, example. Um, so this is motivated by an autonomous vehicle application, let's say, where you want to do lane keeping. So you want to just keep the vehicle uh, kind of centered in the, the middle, in, in, the, in the lane. Uh, and for that, you need to detect uh, the boundaries of the, the lane. And that's, that's what we're going to uh, think about, uh, a kind of toy version of, of this. Um, so I guess the, the way uh, one could start to go about doing this is to do some kind of edge detection. Right, like figure out where edges in the scene are, uh, and then once you can do edge detection, you can figure out like what are the, the edges uh, corresponding to the, the lane uh, that the vehicle is, is in. Um, so yeah, even this like relatively kind of simple sounding problem of edge detection is, is surprisingly uh, complicated. Uh, so so what is a what exactly is an edge? Uh, so you can have an edge uh, or an apparent edge in an image uh, that's caused by many different uh, factors. Uh, so, for example, surface normal uh, discontinuity. Uh, so, if I have a, an object like this, uh, if I look at the, the normal vector to the surface, uh, there's a kind of sharp uh, discontinuity, a sharp change um, going from uh, like somewhere over here to, to somewhere like over here. Uh, and that appears as an edge in the image. Uh, depth discontinuity. Uh, so, if you're looking at, again, let's say this object uh, from over there. Uh, there's a change in the depth, so the depth is a certain value over here, uh, and then if you move uh, sideways, the depth like suddenly changes to, to something else, uh, and that appears as, a, as an edge as well. Uh, color discontinuity, uh, that, that's another case where you see edges. Uh, illumination discontinuity, so uh, the boundary between the, the shadow and kind of not the shadow, uh, that also appears as, a, as an edge in the image. Um, so if we think about a really kind of uh, simple way to, to do edge detection, um, so actually I guess maybe I, we can uh, pose this as a question. So what, what would be a, a simple way here? Let's say the, the image is just a grayscale image corresponding to um, like a one-dimensional array. Uh, how would you uh, how would you go about detecting edges in the in the image? Good. Yeah, good. So you can look at each uh, adjacent pixel uh, and compute the, the difference. Uh, and uh, uh, sorry, I, yeah, I guess what changed is, is the, the the value here. So uh, going from four to one fifty two, that's a, a big jump. Uh, Forty one to one hundred thirteen, that's a, a a smaller jump. So it's a slightly less clear of an edge. But you can uh, do some kind of thresholding, right? You can take uh, the differences between each uh, adjacent pair of, of pixels uh, and look at where that difference is, is high uh, in, in magnitude. Uh, what I'm doing here is, is looking at the, the difference between uh, a pixel uh, on the right uh, and its kind of uh, left uh, neighbor. Um, there's some kind of padding uh, that needs to, to happen here, so you have to be uh, careful about what goes on at the edges. Uh, what I'm doing implicitly here is extending the image a bit to the left and to the right, um, or actually not to the right, so just, just to the, the left. Uh, so I'm assuming that the pixel, this kind of a, a fake pixel, a virtual pixel on the left of this image uh, that has the same uh, intensity value as the leftmost pixel, uh, so uh, a value equal to 5. Uh, and then for the adjacent pixels, uh, we're just calculating uh, the difference. So 7 minus 5 is 2, uh, 6 minus uh, 7 is negative 1, and, and so on. Uh, and you see that there's a, a kind of peak here, uh, so at, at 72, uh, uh, and you can set some threshold and say that if the image uh, kind of difference or intensity difference is larger than a threshold, uh, that corresponds to, a, to an edge. Um, all right, so here's the, the specific uh, operation that, that we were doing. Uh, one kind of useful way to, uh, to do this computation uh, is via what are known as uh, convolutions. So I'll describe this in this kind of uh, edge detection uh, scenario, uh, but this general idea is going to be uh, super useful uh, later on as well. Um, what we're doing here is looking at uh, a 1 by 3 uh, vector. 
uh, so corresponding to negative 1, 1, and 0. Uh, and we're basically going to slide uh, this vector along the, the image uh, and calculate the, the dot product uh, between the vector, this 1 by 3 vector, and the three corresponding uh, pixels in the image. Um, so over here, uh, so yeah, I guess let's, let's do this one. So, um, uh, so it's negative 1 times 5 uh, plus 7 times uh, 1 uh, plus 6 times 0, so that's, that's equal to 2. Uh, and then we do this at, at every uh, location. So we look at this 1 by 3 uh, vector uh, and calculate the, the drop product with the corresponding portion of the, the image. So here it would be 7 times negative 1 uh, plus 6 times 1 plus 41 times 0 and uh, so on. Uh, and that's, that's the, the exact same uh, computation that we did before. Uh, just uh, described via this kind of uh, sliding uh, dot product rule. I guess any questions on on that? Okay. Um, so we choose a particular value for this vector that we're computing the, the dot product with. So negative one one zero, uh, negative one one zero. Uh, but you could have picked other uh, kind of choices as well. So for example, zero uh, minus one one. Uh, or like minus one, zero, one, uh, where you look at the difference not between adjacent pixels, but between uh, kind of uh, pixels that are one uh, removed. Uh, and yeah, I think think about how uh, this extends to 2D images as well. It's the same basic idea. Instead of a, a one by three vector, you would have maybe a, a three by three vector, and then you take a, a dot product and slide that uh, three by three vector uh, as like different portions portions of the uh, 2D image. Uh, instead of the, the 1D uh, image. Uh, all right, I guess, can someone see what uh, challenges with uh, with this approach are for, for doing edge detection? So just looking at the, the differences, uh, how well is that going to work in, in practice? Yeah, if you're using these, it's, it has to be within like one pixel where the cutoff is, where it's maybe a softer edge than just a definitive one pixel. Yep, yeah, yeah uh, that, that's definitely a, uh, an important uh, consideration. So it might be, uh, not as sharp of a edge, uh, so the threshold value uh, uh, kind of like determines like whether or not you pick up edges. So if it's a, sh uh, a relatively uh, kind of shallow like rise in the image intensity, then this might not uh, pick it up. Uh, other challenges that, that people see with with this. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So the extension to 2D uh, is, I guess, slightly more complicated, right? So you would you would want to detect edges uh, at different orientations, uh, and the way we describe it here, it's only doing uh, like only getting uh, 1D images. That you can modify a bit. You can uh, like set up uh, multiple uh, arrays that correspond to differences uh, along different directions. Uh, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess that, that, that's what I was saying before. So you can come up with, uh, actually, this might be a useful exercise. Like, I mean, like, if it's like diagonal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you could, you could do like diagonal, like edges as well. Uh, go ahead. This one for edges that we see uh, based on like texture, for example. Yeah. Uh, because, like, for example, the luminance is the same on both, on both sides. Yeah. But there's the pattern difference we can see that. Yep. Yeah, good, yeah. Uh, and that, that's, I guess, related to the, the previous point about uh, just doing a very local uh, computation, right? We're just looking at uh, like a, a three uh, pixel like patch and doing computation based on that. Yeah, I guess so people see other challenges with, with this. Go ahead. Maybe it's like the initial level three? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so actually, the, the opposite is, is uh, the, the challenge that, that I wanted to, to point out. Uh, so if you have an image that's um, kind of very like sharply changing, so there's a bit of noise in the, the image. And again, we're thinking of this as just a 1D image. Uh, so the image intensities uh, are basically the same uh, for a bit, and then kind of rise up and then uh, like flatten again. But this, locally, there's a, a bunch of noise. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the derivative, uh, so just the discrete derivative, uh, it looks extremely uh, noisy. Uh, and setting some kind of like threshold here uh, is not going to uh, to work uh, particularly well. Question? Yeah. So one option is to uh, smooth things out. Uh, actually, this is 
case before doing that, this is another, uh, just a kind of 2D uh, version of what this looks like. So uh, original image on the, the left, uh, and just a little bit of noise, uh, just random uh, noise added to each pixel um, that, that causes this uh, kind of uh, noisiness in the, in the image. Um, all right, so yeah, like you said, uh, one uh, option is to, to smooth out the image before uh, we do this edge uh, detection uh, computation. Um, again, there are many ways to, to do this. Uh, maybe the simplest way is called mean smoothing. Um, so mean smoothing you can implement uh, with this uh, like array uh, where it's like one third, one third, one third, uh, and it's the same operation uh, as before. So you take this array uh, and you take the dot product with the corresponding uh, portions uh, of, uh, of, of the image. Uh, and basically what this, is, what this is doing is replacing each uh, pixel value uh, with the average uh, of uh, itself and its two neighboring uh, pixel values. Um, another way to implement smoothing is what's known as a Gaussian smoothing. Uh, so you take the uh, probability density function of a Gaussian distribution uh, and then you like discretize it. Uh, this is a very coarse discretization. We're going from like one, uh, uh, I guess one quarter to one half to, to one quarter. Um, so what that is doing is giving more weight uh, to the pixel that you're looking at, uh, but then also uh, taking in some contribution uh, from the, the neighboring uh, pixel. So it's taking uh, a weighted sum uh, where the weight for a particular pixel uh, is one half and its neighboring pixels uh, are one uh, quarter. Uh, that's another way to, uh, to do uh, smoothing. Uh, the nice kind of feature about this way of, of doing smoothing is you can um, <coughs> like change how much smoothing you're doing. So if you look at the, uh, the variance of this Gaussian distribution, if you make it wider, uh, then that's doing more smoothing. Uh, if you make it like very uh, kind of peaky, if you make the, uh, the variance small, uh, then that's not doing much smoothing. Uh, I guess that's the extreme case, if you just had zero, one, zero, uh, that's doing no smoothing at all, right? This is taking each pixel and replacing it with the, uh, the original uh, value. And you can think of that as uh, the limit uh, as the, the variance of the Gaussian uh, goes to, to zero. Um, yeah, if you want to do more smoothing, uh, I guess a, a different way is to choose a larger window size. Uh, so there's nothing fundamental about like a one by three vector. Uh, you could take a one by like five vector or, or even larger, uh, and you could do mean smoothing or just like Gaussian smoothing uh, with this larger uh, vector. So the vector is called a, a kernel, uh, the, the vector that you uh, kind of slide along the, the image and take uh, dot products with. Uh, and you can extend these to uh, 2D as well. Uh, so here's mean smoothing uh, with uh, a, a 2D uh, convolution. Uh, so now instead of a 1 by 3 array, we're looking at a, a 3 by 3 array, uh, each element of which is, is 1 9th. Um, and you take this little kind of image patch, like this, this 3 by 3 patch, uh, and then you slide it along uh, different portions of the image and you calculate the, the dot product. So you look at a three by three patch in the image, uh, take the element wise product between that three by three patch uh, and the uh, three by three uh, uh, matrix of, of, uh, of all one lines, and then you sum up those element wise uh, products. Question? Yeah, so at the corners or at the edges, you have to be a bit careful. Uh, there's, there's different ways of, of handling the edges. Uh, one way is just to take the, the boundary of the, the image uh, and just extend that. Uh, so it's, it's yeah, basically like padding the image. Um, and then, yeah, then you can do this uh, like convolution uh, operation. Quick. Sorry, is this, uh, is this um, changing the center of that square? Yes, yeah, exactly. So for each uh, center, like as, as you change the center, you calculate this uh, dot product, and then you replace the pixel value uh, at that center uh, with the, uh, the value that you get after the, the dot product. Question? So this would only help in edge detection and the case where there are too many edges in the sense like it's finding too many variations of margin, but not the case where it's not finding any yes. Yeah, so this is specifically targeting <clears throat> this issue of, uh, of noise. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of what you're saying, there's like too many edges in, in the sense that the, the derivative 
uh, is jumping quite a bit. Uh, uh, and so by smoothing it out, you're only focusing on the kind of large uh, jump and not the, the small, like, local jumps. Yep. Um, all right. So, so yeah, I guess that, that's what this looks like. So you have a, a noisy image. Uh, you do this uh, smoothing, uh, and you get a slightly uh, blurrier uh, image uh, with this mean uh, smoothing filter. Um, and this is the, the Gaussian uh, smoothing version, so instead of the, the mean smoothing, uh, so you take a, a two-dimensional uh, uh, Gaussian uh, probability density function corresponding to Gaussian, you discretize it, uh, and that's kind of the, the patch uh, that you get. This is a, a five by five patch. You can, uh, again, work with other uh, sizes. Uh, but it's the same basic idea, right? You take this image patch, uh, you slide it along a different portions of the image, you calculate the dot product, and you replace each uh, pixel value uh, with the, the computed uh, dot product. Um, and yeah, like, like I was saying before, uh, I guess one nice feature about Gaussian smoothing uh, is that you can change the amount of smoothing by changing the, uh, the variance of the, the Gaussian. Uh, so on the left is the original image, uh, and then you kind of have sequentially uh, larger and larger uh, variances uh, for the, the Gaussian. Um, so you're basically taking uh, averages across a, a larger like, neighborhood around each uh, pixel. Uh, and yeah, it's kind of, uh, yeah, I guess you can see that it gets like blurrier, blurrier and blurrier as you increase the, uh, the variance of the, uh, the underlying uh, Gaussian. Um, all right, I guess questions on, on this? Go ahead. In practice, is this a reversible process? Um, that's a good question. So not necessarily, like you are losing some, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, you're losing some information, right? Um, or at least intuitively you are. Uh, I don't know if you're... Yeah, I guess could you in principle uh, reconstruct the original image from the, the blur dot version? Um, no, I think because you're, you're replacing each pixel value uh, with, its, with the average of the neighbors, uh, you're only getting the average. You're not getting uh, the exact uh, pixel values of the, the neighbors. Uh, so you're losing some information. Uh, so I think you can kind of reconstruct it to some degree, but you're not going to get it uh, exactly right. Good. Other questions? Uh, OK, so what we described uh, right now is called uh, linear uh, filtering. Uh, linear because we're taking a linear combination, so a dot product of some image patch, uh, so weighted sum uh, with uh, of, of like nearby uh, pixel uh, intensity values, and just uh, a piece of terminology like I mentioned before, these arrays or, or matrices that you convolve, like that you take the dot product with, uh, are known as uh, kernels. Okay, so just as a as a check to, to I guess make sure we understand uh, what this uh, kind of convolution operation is doing. Uh, let's say I give you this kernel. Uh, what what is this doing? Like, what's the transformed image going to look like once we uh, like do this convolution operation? Go ahead. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So it moves the, the image uh, one pixel to the left. Uh, and the, yeah, the reason is if you look at if you just focus on one particular pixel, uh, what's going on is that that pixel value is being replaced by the pixel value of its neighbor to the right. Uh, so the, the kind of aggregate like effect, if you do this on every pixel, is that the, the whole image uh, is shifted to the left. You're just copying everything over uh, one pixel uh, to, the, uh, to the left. OK, um, so we can apply these, these filters and do these like, operations uh, sequentially. Uh, so, uh, I guess for instance, you can first apply a smoothing operation, smooth out the, uh, the image, uh, and then apply like this derivative operation uh, to do uh, edge detection. So you can think of this as kind of like multiple stages of processing, and you can make this arbitrarily uh, complicated uh, more and more um, filters that, that you apply uh, sequentially. All right, so, uh, a question, sorry. Yeah, so you can you can do a lot with uh, with different kernels. Uh, so you can yeah, like I said, you can 
uh, rotate the, uh, the image uh, like maybe 90 degrees or, or 45 degrees. Uh, and it's useful, I think, to, to think about what like these geometric operations look like and, and what their like, corresponding uh, kernels are. Uh, but yeah, I like, guess these simple operations, especially if you like, chain them together, uh, you can do uh, like really complicated uh, like image uh, transformations. Uh, good other questions? Go ahead. Sorry, I have one more. Yeah. In the mean smoothing algorithm, are you like referencing an original array of pixel values or are you like kind of recursively using average oh. values and then re-averaging them? Uh, so the former. Um, so it's not like you, I, I think the way to think about it is that you do all of these operations in parallel. Uh, so you don't uh, do one and then, uh, actually I guess it might be easier to, uh, to just uh, draw this out. So if I have some, let's just look at a, a 1D uh, array, so it's like uh, 2, 4, uh, 7, 13, um, and let, let's say we're doing the, uh, the mean uh, smoothing, uh, actually let's make it slightly bigger. Um, so the, I guess the, the first thing we do is like pad the, the image uh, somehow, so extend the, uh, the image, um, so we can like add in like a, an extra, uh, like two, uh, let's say over here. Um, so we're taking the, the average uh, of these three uh, pixel <coughs> locations, so two to uh, four, um, so yeah, I guess that's uh, eight by three. Uh, so it's not the case that when we do the next uh, calculation, we use like eight by three uh, as the, the pixel value. Uh, what we do instead is look at the average of, of these three. Uh, so it's two, four, uh, seven, so that's 13 over or three uh, for, for this, uh, and, and so on. Yeah, so, so I think the, maybe the cleanest conceptual way to think about this is you do all of these operations, these dot products uh, in parallel and then uh, create the, uh, the transformed image uh, with that. Does that answer that question? Yeah, thank okay, you. Good. Other questions? OK. So uh, yeah, I guess what I wanted to say is that until around like 2012 or, or so, um, uh, computer vision was like largely like dominated by hand uh, engineered like approaches. Uh, so basically, what people would do is like come up with uh, clever and clever uh, kernels. Uh, for uh, like implementing different uh, kind of geometric uh, operations, uh, so hand design kernels corresponding to uh, different like uh, features in the, the image. Uh, so things like edges, corners, uh, more and more like complicated uh, features, and then you chain these uh, computations like this kind of sequential processing together uh, to do something like uh, like object uh, detection, uh, for, for instance. Uh, nowadays, uh, vision is like. Uh, entirely uh, dominated by uh, by deep learning, uh, the basic computations are actually uh, like similar uh, or even identical to uh, to what I described, like spe spe specifically uh, convolutions. Uh, but the idea is instead of specifying these kernels by hand, uh, you learn them given uh, lots and lots of uh, data, um, and this image like processing pipeline uh, still has the same basic structure where you do. Uh, some operation that's implemented using a, this convolution operation, this dot product operation, and then you uh, take that and you process it more and, and so on. Uh, but that processing is learned uh, automatically uh, given a, a gigantic uh, data set. All right, uh, question? Um, what's that approach then? Like, what are the actual input numbers that are being given for the model? Like, how are they like the intensity values? Uh, yeah, so it, it's. Uh, like some image representation, uh, so this depends on the on the data set. Usually, it's like RGB uh, values, so the the uh, image is, is represented as, as some like array of, uh, of RGB values, uh, and then you have some associated label. Um, so like what object is represented in the image, for instance, uh, and it's the same basic pipeline, like uh, doing these convolutions uh, sequentially, uh, with some like additional computations as well that, that we'll go into more detail on. 
but you basically learn what these kernels are instead of specifying them, them by hand. That's the, the major kind of uh, difference. Yeah. All right, I think the, uh, um, actually, I guess one more comment. Uh, so we'll get to deep learning in uh, two lectures, uh, but I think it's actually useful to spend a little bit of time like trying to do things by hand, like just to uh, appreciate the, the challenges and also just to build some more like intuition about, uh, about vision. Uh, so we're going to do that in the, the next lecture. Um, so in the next lecture, we're going to talk about uh, optical flow, uh, which is this problem of figuring out where uh, things are, are moving in the image or where things seem to be moving in the image. Uh, and we're going to do this in kind of the, the old school way. So we're going to think hard about the problem. Uh, we're going to come up with a, an algorithm. Uh, and yeah, uh, going through this process is going to help us understand uh, like some of the challenges and also just some of the, the features of, uh, of computer vision. Uh, and then after that, uh, we'll think about how to uh, use neural networks to, to learn these uh, kind of computations uh, automatically given some data set. All right, I think that's all I had. I guess questions, go ahead. Say that one more time, sorry, I missed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. So typically, uh, like a given data set will just have like the same sized images, or if they don't, then you do some kind of like subsampling or, or super sampling to, to make it uh, the same size uh, images. Good. All right, so yeah, I guess we left some time to hand out uh, camera modules uh, for the drone, so you'll install them. Uh, it's relatively simple to install. You'll install them uh, for the next assignment, and then we'll use them for subsequent uh, assignments as well. Uh, so yeah, I guess if each member, one member from each team, or, or each team can just uh, come, uh, Nathan uh, and Eric will hand out the, the camera modules. I'll see you on Thursday.